Hey everybody, welcome back to BibleTalk.tv. My name is Marty Kessler. This is the fifth lesson in a series of lessons on apologetics. This one is entitled Prophecies About Jesus That Are Fulfilled. That's not really the technical title of it, but it is about prophecies of Jesus that have been fulfilled in Scripture. So this being the fifth lesson in a series, it'll be the last one. If you've watched the other four, I hope you've enjoyed those and gotten some good out of them. And I'm only too happy to present this one today. So let's talk about these prophecies. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, that He did not come to destroy the law or the prophets or to abolish the law or the prophets. He didn't come to abolish, but He came to fulfill. And that's what Jesus did. Those prophecies were made in the law. They were made in the prophets. And He came and fulfilled those. And we're going to look at several passages now along with this one that talk about the passages, the scriptures that He fulfilled. Jesus brought those prophecies full circle. That's what He's saying here. He didn't come to destroy. He came to fulfill and He did bring all things full circle. In John chapter 5, verse 39, as Jesus was talking to some people who, who actually wanted to kill Him because He was claiming to be God and His claim was bona fide because He was in fact God, but he said this to them, you search the scriptures. And I've highlighted the, word, uh, the words, the scriptures here, as I have some other words later on in the text, because I want to emphasize that he's talking about the scriptures. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. This is Jesus telling those who want to kill him that your own scriptures testify about me. And of course, he was talking about the Old Covenant, as we would say it today, the, the Old Testament, the Law, the Prophets, the Psalms even. These are the scriptures He was referencing that testified about Him. Jesus also said to His companions on the way to Emmaus, this is after His resurrection, this is Luke chapter 24, said, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. So He's referencing the prophets again and He's, he's sort of uh, reprimanding these guys for not realizing that everything the prophet said has been fulfilled in him. Was it not necessary, he goes on, for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? So he's expressing to them that everything that happened to him was in the prophets and that's what's been fulfilled in what he did. Referencing back to the idea of him not coming to destroy the law of the prophets, but to fulfill. And so that's what he's talking to these guys about. He further says to them, Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. So if Jesus could do this, if he could go back to Moses, go back to the prophets and explain his own circumstances to them through those writings, we ought to be able to do that yet today. Later, when Jesus was with the apostles and those gathered with them, again, after the resurrection, he said, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Once again, stating to them, it is the words of God and the, uh, and the writings of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms that were fulfilled in his life and all that happened with him. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. Jesus affirming that it is in the scriptures that it's written that these things would happen. When Philip, this is in Acts chapter 8, approached the Ethiopian eunuch, he taught from Isaiah 53. It says, Philip opened his mouth and beginning from this scripture from Isaiah 53, he preached Jesus to him, to the Ethiopian eunuch. You read about this in Acts chapter 8. The eunuch was traveling on his way from Jerusalem. He'd been there to worship. He was reading from the scroll of Isaiah chapter 53. And Philip asked him if he understood what he was reading. And he said, how can I unless some man guides me? And so Philip began at that same spot Isaiah 53, and preached Jesus to the man. When Paul was preaching in the synagogue of Pisidian Antioch, he said this, To us, the message of this salvation has been sent for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers recognizing neither him nor the utterances of the prophets, 
which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled these by condemning him. And this is especially interesting as he's affirming, as Jesus did, that the message of Jesus is in the prophets and that those who were enemies of Jesus fulfilled those prophecies by condemning him and crucifying him and putting him to death in the way they did. Isn't that interesting that God's enemies are the ones who fulfilled the prophecies concerning his son? And those prophecies were centuries old. Still in Acts chapter 13, it says, Though they found no ground for putting him to death, they asked Pilate that he be executed. And when they had carried out all that was written concerning him, coming back to that theme, all these things are written about Jesus in the prophets and the Psalms. And in the words of Moses, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. So we come to Apollos later on in the book of Acts. It says, There was a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the Scriptures. So in the first century, when he came to Ephesus, what Scriptures would he have been mighty in except the Old Testament Scriptures, as we would call them now? The writings of Moses, the writings of the prophets, the Psalms, all of those Old Testament writings, he was mighty in those. And it says, he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the Scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Wouldn't you like to know what scriptures he used? Well, we know where they would have been. They would have been in the Old Testament. But he used those passages to powerfully refute and demonstrate that Jesus was the Christ. So, Apollos demonstrated in the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Can we do this today? That's the question, using the same texts that were available to Apollos. And of course, the answer is a resounding yes. We could begin with Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, which was spoken by the Lord around 4,000 B.C. That's about 6,000 years ago. And later it was written down by Moses around 1500 to 1400 B.C. And this is what Genesis 3.15 says. To Satan the Lord said, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He, the seed of woman, shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. How about that from Genesis 3.15, 1,500 years or so before Jesus came in the flesh. This was written down prophetically. In 880, or 687 B.C., we're told where her seed would be born. This is from the prophet Micah, chapter 5 and verse 2. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be a ruler in Israel." His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. So this is Micah, hundreds of years before Jesus came in the flesh, prophesying that this one who would go forth for the Lord would be born in little Bethlehem. And so we read this in Luke chapter 2, verses 4 to 7. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because... He was of the house and family of David in order to register along with Mary who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth and she gave birth to her firstborn son. And we all know who he was, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, born in Bethlehem of Judah, just as Micah had prophesied hundreds of years before. And then there is this text again from Genesis chapter 49, where Jacob, Jacob whose name was later changed to Israel, is blessing his boys, his sons. And in chapter 49, verse 10, he says this to Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be obedience of the peoples. So Jacob, prophetically speaking, over a thousand years before Jesus came, talking about the fact that the scepter shall not depart from Judah, the tribe from which Jesus would come, until Shiloh comes. This is Jacob's prophecy to his son Judah regarding the scepter, the royalty, the fact that kingship would reside with Judah. So we've got this passage in Luke chapter 3 and verse 33, where we have record, uh, a record of the genealogy of Jesus, showing, of course, that he is from the tribe of Judah. 
talking about the son of Abinadab, the son of Admin, the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah. And so the text shows, of course, that Jesus was from the lineage of Judah, just as Jacob had prophesied in Genesis chapter 49. Then we've got in 680 BC, we're told with uh, specificity what family and uh, tribe Jesus would come from. In Isaiah chapter 11, Isaiah says this, verse 1, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, Jesse being the father of David, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. That's chapter 11 of Isaiah, verse 1. In chapter 10, we read similarly, In that day the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. So this one who would be the, the offspring of Jesse would be glorious and he would be a signal to the people. And we find that back to the genealogy of Luke, Jesus was the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz. So again, we see Jesus, the offspring of Jesse in the, in the physical human lineage in which is, uh, he is presented here. So we've got another prophecy, not just of the tribe of Judah, but the specific family, and that being the family of Jesse and the line of David from which he would come. We're also told in 680 BC that he would be born of a virgin. From Isaiah chapter 7, this is what the prophet would say. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, which of course the word Emmanuel, the name Emmanuel means God with us. And then we read this from Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. This is appearing to Joseph, the husband or uh, the one betrothed to, uh, to Mary, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Of course, Joseph had not lain with Mary by this point. They were not technically married. And so it was uh, a potential um, scandal that she be with child. And the angel is here explaining, don't be afraid to take Mary to you because that child is of the Holy Spirit. No man has been with her. She remains a virgin. Now, concerning the differences in the Hebrew and Greek words translated virgin, I want to say this. The Hebrew word Alma is used in Isaiah 7.14, which could be interpreted young maiden rather than specifically virgin. But you need to remember that the Lord certainly had a specific meaning in mind. That's what we must uh, keep in mind is that He had a meaning in mind. So Matthew and Luke come along later and they both use the Greek word parthenos, which means specifically virgin. In addition to this, they are careful to tell us, as well as in using the word, that she was with child before being with a man. This is from Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 and verse 25, and Luke chapter 1, verse 34 to 35. So the testimony of Scripture is, from Isaiah and from Matthew and Luke, that Mary was a virgin when she came to be with child of Jesus. And that child was, of course, of the Holy Spirit. It was foretold that Jesus would be preceded by a messenger. This is from Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. And this text is also to be found in Malachi chapter 1. Very similar, almost word for word prophecy about the messenger that would precede Jesus as the Messiah. Malachi chapter 3 verse 1, Behold, I am going to send my messenger and he will clear the way before me and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So here is a testimony from Isaiah and from Malachi that Jesus coming would be preceded by a messenger. And of course that messenger was John the baptizer. John came, cousin to Jesus, and he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. This is from Luke chapter 1, verse 17. It says, It is he who will go forth as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people 
prepared for the Lord. This was John's work to prepare the way for the Lord. And this is exactly what he did. He was Jesus' cousin, being about six months older. And this was his work as we know it from prophecy. Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, would be rejected. Now, think about this as we read these texts. If you were a Jewish prophet making these things up, why would you write about a Messiah that would come and be rejected? There wouldn't be much glory in that. And yet that's exactly what Isaiah and other prophets tell us would happen to the Messiah. From chapter 53 and verse 3, we read this. Among the entire uh, 53rd chapter of Isaiah is about the rejection of Jesus and actually begins in the last part of chapter 52. But this particular text speaks specifically of it. It says, He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. This is Isaiah writing prophetically of the Messiah who would come. And then when John the Apostle writes... Beginning his uh, gospel, he says this, He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. And of course, as John bears this out, we see it borne out in all the other gospels, that on almost every page, Jesus was confronted and contradicted and uh, withstood by those whom uh, should have been receiving him, but they did not. Luke 23, verse 18, we read this during the... Uh, trial of Jesus, they cried out all together saying, away with this man and release for us Barabbas. So not only are they rejecting Jesus, but they're rejecting Jesus in favor of one who was an insurrectionist and a murderer. That's the nature of Jesus' rejection, told prophetically. Jesus' betrayal was also foretold right down to the price paid for him and even what was to be done with the money. In Psalm 41.9, the psalmist, of course, references the betrayal at this point. Psalm 41, 9 says, Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. And then we read this in Matthew chapter 26, verses 49 to 50. And immediately he went to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you have come for. And then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. Of course, this is the record of Jesus, uh, Judas betraying his Lord there in the garden in front of uh, all the other apostles. Zechariah said this, talking about the details of Jesus' betrayal. I said to them, if it is good in your sight, give me my wages, but if not, never mind. So they weighed out 30 shekels of silver as my wages. And then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, that magnificent price at which I was valued by them. So I took the 30 shekels of silver, threw them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Uh, I want you to notice those underlinings. Those are mine. I'm trying to emphasize those particular aspects of this passage. Because this was made in about 520 B.C. by the prophet Zechariah over 500 years before this would actually be fulfilled regarding Jesus. That 30 pieces of silver would be weighed out as the price for Judas' betrayal. And when Judas repented, he would come back and they would throw that money into the temple. Uh, it would be thrown into the temple and they would collect it back up and use it to buy a potter's field. Very specific, very detailed. And we know, of course, this is exactly what happened. And let's see just how much detail is represented. The money was weighed out. That's what it says in Matthew chapter 26, verse 15. That's how they did it in those days. Shekels had to be a certain weight to be fair, and they weighed out those shekels. The amount was 30 shekels of silver. Not just 30 shekels, but 30 shekels of silver, as the prophecy stated. The money was thrown. That's what Matthew records, that it was thrown. The money was thrown into the temple. That's where it was thrown. And then the money was then used to buy uh, a potter's field. All of that prophetically uh, stated by Zechariah over 500 years before it happens. And another, or the same point I'd, I'd like to make again that I made before, this prophecy was fulfilled by the enemies of Jesus. You would think those guys would have known their own prophetics, uh, uh, the, the words of prophecy concerning the Messiah, 
and they would have not wanted to use 30 pieces of silver. They would say, hey, use 25 or 35, anything but 30 and anything but silver. And then don't use that money to buy a potter's field because that's what Zechariah said would happen. And yet the enemies of God fulfill his words through his prophet, just as we see here uh, stated by Matthew. So how much details provided concerning the crucifixion? Uh, the Psalms of David were written about 1000 BC, and yet the Psalms tell us this, Psalm 22, verses 7 to 8. David wrote, All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag the head, saying, Commit yourself to the Lord. Let Him deliver Him. Let Him rescue Him, because He delights in Him. Now, if you're familiar with the record of Jesus' crucifixion as the Gospel writers gave it to us, you know that this was the scene there. Jesus being sneered at. They were wagging their heads. They were saying, you commit yourself to God, let God deliver you. This was written by David, however, about a thousand years before it happened to Jesus. David also wrote in Psalm 22, 16, they pierced my hands and my feet. This is particularly interesting to me because there is no record of any of David's enemies ever piercing his hands or his feet. And yet a thousand years before it happens to Jesus, David writes this down in this psalm. And then we read, still in the 22nd Psalm, they look, they stare at me. Of course, where was Jesus? He was suspended on a cross above the earth, there on display for everyone to see. Still in the 22nd Psalm, he says, they divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. There is no record of this ever happening to David, and yet it tells in a very detailed manner exactly what happened with Jesus. They had his clothing, they had his garments, they divided things uh, according to how they desired to divide those things, but when it came to his outer garment, it could not be torn unless that or if it was torn, it would have torn it up. And so the Roman soldiers decided to cast lots for it. This is in exact fulfillment of what David had said a thousand years before. And yet David wrote these things down without there being any record of any of these things ever happening to him. But they all happened in a very detailed way to Jesus. Very interesting. There's more detail here from Psalm 34 verse 20. It says, he keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken, which is very interesting because this references back to the Passover. And Paul would write to the church at Corinth that Jesus is our Passover. Of course, that Passover lamb was the shadow of what was to come and Jesus was the reality that came. He fulfilled that Passover promise. He was the lamb that was given so that no one would have to die. And of that lamb, it is said, not one single bone of that lamb should be broken. And of course, Jesus died without any of his limbs being broken. But you remember what happened to the thieves, those two thieves that were crucified, one on the right and one on the left of Jesus. They came to them, they were still alive. And so in order to hasten their deaths, the Roman soldiers broke their legs. So if everything was as it should have been, naturally speaking, Jesus should have also been still alive and his legs would have been broken. But his legs were not broken because by that time he had given his spirit back to God. And by the way, just as a, as a, a note of personal interest, when he died, he didn't die with a whimpering last breath. He cried out with a loud voice, the text says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. That's how Jesus died. And that is why when they came to him and he being dead, they did not break any of his bones. When we look at Exodus chapter 12 and verse 42, we are referenced back to that Passover lamb I mentioned a while ago. And this is well worth studying how that lamb was to be selected and how it was to be treated. And you can imagine, pull that little lamb into your home and you keep it for five days. And then you kill that lamb on the end of the fifth day. And that's what happened with Jesus. He was our lamb, totally innocent and yet slain as the Passover lamb was slain. Isaiah chapter 52 verses 14 to 15 says this, Just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Thus he will sprinkle 
many nations. Think about this prophecy of Isaiah given over 700 years before it happened to Jesus. People were astonished. His appearance was marred more than any man. So think about Jesus resting in the garden that night. No food, perhaps, uh, perhaps no water, probably very little sleep, spending whatever uh, way he was confined for that entire night. And then on the next day, he was brought before the court. He was bound. He was slapped in the face on at least two different occasions. He was hit over the head with a reed. A crown of thorns was pressed onto his head. And then uh, before his crucifixion, he was beaten with the flagellum. And that is a whip that has uh, many thongs coming off the end of it. And on the end of those thongs would be tied pieces of bone or metal or stone so that as that uh, weapon would strike your flesh, it would penetrate and perhaps tear off chunks of flesh. And you can just imagine Jesus being beaten by those Romans who were not um, limited in how they would beat their prisoners. Sometimes perhaps those thongs would come around to the front and hit Jesus in the face. However it happened, whatever took place, His appearance was marred more than any man, Isaiah would say, and His form more than the sons of men. And this reference to sprinkling, thus He will sprinkle many nations, of course. Any Jew would recognize the reference to blood. That's how uh, covenants were ratified with the sprinkling of blood. And so Jesus' form being marred more than any man, He would definitely be shedding His blood. It wouldn't be spilt like it was an accident. It would be shed, shed on purpose, as was the blood of the Passover lamb. So there's no record of crucifixion being used as a means of execution until sometime in the 500s B.C. That's the first extant record we have of crucifixion being used. The Romans didn't begin using crucifixion until around the time of Christ's birth. So how is it that all those prophecies concerning crucifixion could be so specific and so exact and yet be fulfilled in Christ? But we've got more detail. We look at Amos chapter 9, and this is from uh, 755 or so B.C., and this is what Amos has to tell us in chapter 8 and verse 9. It will come about in that day, declares the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon and make the earth dark in broad daylight. This is what the prophet Amos said over 700 years before the coming of Christ. Matthew records this in his gospel. says, From the sixth hour darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. The sixth hour, of course, would have been noon. The ninth hour would have been three o'clock. This is the time of day that the sun would be at its peak and be at its brightest. And yet Matthew records that the sun, uh, that darkness fell rather upon the land for those three hours. Now, secular sources recorded accounts of the darkness during the crucifixion. Phlegon, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that name right, might be Phlegon. At any rate, he's not around to correct me, so I'm going to call him Phlegon at this point without any disrespect at all. He was a Greek historian who wrote an extensive chronology around 137 A.D., And this is what he wrote in commenting on that darkness. He says, In the fourth year of this 202nd Olympiad, that's about 33 AD, there was the greatest eclipse of the sun, and it became night in the sixth hour of the day, that is at noon, so that the stars even appeared in the heavens. There was a great earthquake in Bithynia, and many things were overturned in Nicaea. So he calls it an eclipse without any further explanation. And it was so dark that the stars appeared in the heavens. That has to be quite dark. You don't see stars in the middle of the day without there being quite a bit of darkness. And this is from a secular historian. This isn't someone who is a member of the church or some preacher or some would-be apostle trying to write about this. This is a secular historian writing these things down. And this record has been found and preserved. We also have the pagan historian Thallus. Uh, He wrote a regional history around 52 AD. Though his original work is lost, he was quoted by the historian Julius Africanus. And this is what Thallus says through Africanus. In the third book of his histories, he explains away the darkness as an eclipse of the sun. Unreasonably, as it seems to me, says Apollos. So 
We've got these two records of the darkness taking place at the crucifixion of Jesus. And it's interesting that the fact that they tried to explain this darkness away is solid evidence that it happened. Isn't that interesting that once again we see those who would not necessarily be friends of Christ or friends of God supporting what God has said. Even the deaths of Jesus' burial were foretold. This is back again to the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. And Isaiah writing prophetically, of course, about what happened to the with the disposition of Jesus' body. Isaiah said in chapter 53, verse 9, His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. So, he was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death. A rich man. Isn't that interesting? So Matthew says this, When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph. Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. So Isaiah's prophetic words over 700 years before they were to take place were fulfilled perfectly by Joseph of Arimathea. So what have we seen so far in all of this? We've seen that Jesus would receive a slight injury while dealing a defeating blow to Satan. We've seen where he would be born. We've seen what tribe he would come from. We've seen what family from within that tribe he would come. We have seen that he would be born of a virgin. We have seen that he would be preceded by a messenger in the spirit and power of Elijah. We have also seen that he would be rejected by his own when he came. We have seen that he would be betrayed by a close friend, that the betrayal price would be weighed out, that the betrayal price would be 30 pieces of silver, that it would be thrown and it would be thrown into the temple, and then it would be used to buy a potter's field. A lot of detail there, as many other prophecies had detail. We've seen intimate details of Jesus' death. He was sneered at and mocked. Hands and feet were pierced. He was on display to be stared at. His garments were gambled over. No bone was broken, even though the bones of others were broken. He had a marred appearance. There was darkness at noon, and he was buried with a rich man or in a rich man's tomb. So these are just a few of the most obvious prophecies and their fulfillments that we've looked at so far. But what about the many others? What about the fact that his family had to go to Egypt? for uh, his safety. That's from Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. What about the slaughter of children in, in Ramah? We're talking about Ramah weeping for her children from Jeremiah chapter 31. What about those uh, honors that he received from great kings as he did in his, the time of his ministry from Psalm 72, uh, verses 10 and 15? What about uh, the blind, the deaf, and the lame being healed as Isaiah prophesied would happen? What about the triumphal entry into Jerusalem uh, that Zechariah spoke of? We've got him being adored by infants as in two different occasions, children were brought to him so that he might bless them. And we've got uh, his sheep being scattered as they were in the garden when he was arrested. He was spat on and he was struck. He was scourged. He was numbered with transgressors. His side was pierced, which is what they did to Jesus' body on the cross in lieu of breaking his legs. They saw that he was already dead and so they pierced his side with a spear. What a, what a very specific prophecy that was to be fulfilled in Jesus. And then of course, for him to be resurrected. All of these things, and there are others that we have not included in this lesson, were mentioned prophetically hundreds of years, in some cases thousands of years before Jesus was even born in the flesh. So what will we do with these things? It's no wonder that I find myself in full agreement with the centurion and those with him at the crucifixion when he said, truly, this was, is the Son of God. I hope this lesson has been helpful for you and I hope these are things you'll go back and take a look at that they might increase your faith or uh, convince you that Jesus really is the Son of God. Thank you for listening.